wherever you are situated i am anand ganu uh, founder president of garje marathi global uh, garje marathi global is an organization which has brought together really globally marathi people who have traveled abroad who are non resident marathi or those who have returned to india after spending some good years abroad and have come back to india to serve their own serve our mother india uh, we come together only on two parameters two uh, parameters that is education entrepreneurship and networking so in the series we uh, have invited today sri vinay kolatkar uh, to give his perspective about uh, what happens in this world in this uh, days of uncertainty so how we will be placed in year 2030 so uh, before i invite uh, vinay to say uh, give his expert comment on this very complex subject i would like to tell you about vinay vinay has over 25 years experience planning in the worlds of investment banking and business journalism he is also well is and about a billionaire who disrupts 2020 us presidential election and a shri shri alandan uh, cinematic thriller set in london one of his screen plays uh, undercover the story of jamila has been published on his he is also co author of media wars the battles the the battle to shape our minds a critic of contemporary economic culture and politics using austrian uh, using austrian school paradigms as his main evaluative tool he offers outlook an outlook on the world of economy for this decade over to Vinay Kolatkar. Well, thank you, Anand Ganu. Um, may I ask uh, the participants to mute um, uh, their microphones? Everybody, their, is, mute. Everybody their, is mute. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, thank you, Anand, uh, and thank you also to the Garje Marathi Group for what is a wonderful initiative of webinars. They also have other programs which you can. Um, check up on their website including an innovation academy and an ambitious program uh, to provide a lot of school children with laptops um, so thank you gmg and anand um, i will start with a simultaneous uh, good morning good afternoon and good evening so this morning in um, the eastern part of the world in uh, india and even in early morning in the middle east um good afternoon to people in australia and new zealand and good evening um to the you know americas in the united states east coast as well as west coast we have a fairly decent time uh europe is in the middle of the night so uh, the good morning would have to suffice there um what i'm about to say um i will qualify with one thing it is not financial advice i'm not a financial advisor and it should not be construed as such um so let me um start with a parable what happens when two economists are locked up in a room for an hour and the outs uh, from outside the room typically we hear arguments and when the two economists come out uh, they have three opinions on every subject uh but today here i'm about to say that um economics is actually not a complicated subject um at all if you approach it from a real economics perspective which uh is the austrian school um so i would go so far as to say is that if you ever manage the household budget which pretty much everyone in the audience would have whether you ever been a house husband or house wife or even your own personal budget prudently then you already have a better foundation to understand economics than the bulk of the mainstream economists if you've actually run a small business of your own then you have an even better perspective and we shall shortly see why that is the case 
Um, so I'm offering what is essentially a grim outlook. It's not a prediction for 2030. It's about what we can expect in the next 10 years. And like every predictions, they will certain things will go wrong, obviously. But before I do so, I want to offer a 10 cardinal principles, which anyone can understand. And those principles help you evaluate what's going on in the world. So we don't have to get bogged down in any complex equations, charts, or anything like that. So the first principle is the modern industrial economy is founded on what I would call extreme division of labor. So in primitive economies, or even in Chairman Mao's land, everyone would get a small plot of land. And uh, there's nothing more than sustenance agriculture. And every time there is a disease of the crops or of humans, humans got wiped out. One outcome of the extreme division of labor is that people specialize and excel because that's all they do most of the time, most, most days. And when they excel, it's far more likely for innovation to take place. And that is the fundamental driver of economic growth. So let me again take a simple parable. Um, there is a two people economy on an island. There are two people isolated, two men on an island due to a shipwreck. And every day they try to catch, there's no food on the island, so every day they try to catch fish with their bare hands. And they don't normally succeed in doing, getting anything better than one after hours and hours of toil. And they need that to sustain themselves through to the next day. So that economy is going nowhere until one of them says, I'm going to go hungry today, but I'm going to build a fishnet and so if there are a and b a goes out and builds the fishnet and the next day a and b have a fishnet and that dramatically improves their catching ability it's a great innovation and now they're catching 10 fish in an hour and so not only do they have more than plenty but they have a lot of spare time now they can build a hut for themselves uh, they can go deeper in the island to perhaps find fruit or other things, and so on and so forth. Um, the third very critical uh, part is free trade. Because if you specialize, you have to be able to trade what you produced. If you are an expert in um, running a tea plantation, then um, what will you do with tea that can feed potentially 100,000 people, two cups of tea every day for one year. If that's your production, uh, there's no point in consuming all that yourself. You can't. So you have to be able to trade. And so trade is the other critical element. The next critical element in a modern economy is capital, capital accumulation. Um, capital accumulates when the amount you produce and the profits you make are more than enough to have good returns to capital. By returns to capital, I mean when you invest, when you invest in a bank deposit or in a, you know, investment property, you expect a return. In the old days, you may have expected 8 to 10%. Now you may be happy with 3%, but you need a return, a yield, an interest, or a dividend from your stocks to keep you happy. If in an industry, the demand for the product is so good that the returns are exceptional, it will attract more people, the supply will increase. Eventually, the rate of return and profits go down to normal. And the reverse happens when there are no profits. So profits are not a bad thing, actually. Profits are a signal that the industry is economic. Sustained profits are a signal. The next one is an innovation that wasn't kind of perhaps so planned for, but it's a, an almost a marvelous invention, which is called the Limited Liability Corporation. Uh, it is a legal entity, but the Limited Liability Corporation is not obviously a human being. 
it's an entity behind which people come together for one common purpose and that entity unites those people for that purpose alone they may be completely different from each other in every other respect and they do not if the entity is publicly listed they do not even stay constant shareholders change virtually every day i call that a assignable and synergistic bundle of contracts so a corporation is a bundle of contracts a nexus of contracts uh, this was a term used in a seminal paper in finance by jensen and mecklin in the 70s so the corporation provides a veneer which can contract with employees which can contract with other corporations which can contract with a variety of other people and what it delivers is enormous economies of scale which the modern industrial economy absolutely needs when chairman mao said we can have a steel mill in every backyard he was flat out wrong it's impossible uh, there are many projects that can only be done on a grand scale to provide economies and even many medium and small projects are impossible to do um, unless there is a corporation which unites a range of investors a range of employees um, to contract with it and then it contracts with customers and clients the key here is that there is a freedom of contract you can decide whether to join that corporation or not once you join it they may ask you to do certain things that you don't like but you know before going going in beforehand um, whether the, where the trade off is so it's your decision to contract freely you can leave them you can join them in a free economy no one is slave bound to any corporations although some may introduce certain term limits just as the military does if they train you they want you not to leave for at least 5 years uh, they may provide carrots or incentives to key executives to not leave for a certain time and the world today is very fearful of very large mega corporations um but um there was a enlightened english as in british jurist called jeremy bentham and he invented litigation funding uh, which is now quite popular all over the world not just in the united states what that does in my opinion is it gives the small guy the common man the common woman an ability to keep big corporations honest so most nations in fact are very scared because they think this is pure capitalism and they're scared of the litigious climate in america where juries award compensatory damages and on top of that punitive damages which are many many multiples of the compensatory damages but that actually is what keeps big corporations honest and litigation funding is an industry that helps law firms to get their fees regardless of the outcome so the, they take the risk on cases whether they are class action cases or not they take the risk in suing corporations so if a corporation is dumping product near your home and poisoning the river nearby if those are the facts um capitalism has provided you with an device that you and your neighbors can come together and get a very good outcome clearly the litigation funding firm will get a substantial amount of your payout and there's nothing wrong with that because we should have freedom to contract indeed law firms should have the freedom to contract no win no fee but most law firms um choose not to do so and the the next most important thing actually is the price mechanism price discovery we spoke about price is the only way unconnected people all over the world know what something is worth as long as the price is not interfered with with any sort of subsidies price controls exchange rate manipulations then for producers as well as consumers that is the one aggregate symbol aggregate um more than a symbol is an aggregate 
information in a single data point of just what your decision should be. Should you go and invest in that industry? Should you buy the shares? Should you consume? And as consumers, we know that we are very price sensitive. Anytime we go into a shop, we are attracted to sales. We think we're getting a bargain. So if there is gonna be a free market, there has to be a free market in interest rates as well. And what interest rates are, are the price of credit. It's from 1820 to, to the First World War in 1914, um, the interest rate never went above 4%. It was close to just under 4% in Great Britain. And with some interruption over 150 year period, that is the same is true even also the United States. But what we currently have is activist, what we call central banking, which are manipulating interest rates to the point where they are down to between zero and 1%. And there has been a lot of volatility as well in the last 30 years. So this volatility did not exist when the form of money was decided by the people and the the level of interest rates were decided by the market. And that is a, um, it's a tragedy. And it has some very serious repercussions, which we shall come to very shortly. Lastly, I want to say that, uh, last two things. One is that um, the economy essentially is a unidirectional process. But I mean, the production comes first, and when the production is taken to the market, you get the market value of that production. So suddenly your tea plantation could be worth zero. All the tea could be worth zero if it was defective in some way, if it was poisonous in some way, and if there was a mishap in the production. But it's not automatically that production creates its own demand, but the total sum that you get out of what is produced is available to demand other goods and services. So there is never anything like an insufficiency of overall demand for products. There's always demand. If a particular product, a particular brand of tea was bad one season, the demand will simply shift to another brand or it'll shift from tea to coffee. There's nothing that, that one error of one tea plantation owner of one, or of one brand that is going to have an economy-wide effect. The modern school of ec economics unfortunately believes, and we see this implementation by governments today, as well as every time there's a problem or a recession, they give people money, free money, to go and they encourage them to go and spend as if spending is the problem. But it is a problem because of the way they measure aggregate economic activity. So I'll give you a crude example, for instance. Um, suppose you have 50 people dig up a ditch in the middle of nowhere. They take all the sand out for several days. And then it takes them twice as much time to put all the sand back. And then the ground is just exactly as it was before. Those who measure GDP by the wages that these people got, they think the aggregate product has gone up, whereas in reality, nothing has been produced. So a government could do a bridge to nowhere and leave it half complete, which is completely useless, but the GDP goes up nevertheless. So when, when you have this kind of stimuluses and elaborate spending schemes encouraged by government rather than production that, that is automatically encouraged by the free market. You end up with increases in GDP that, have, that bear no relationship to the real product, to real value, and to real capital. So what, in a nutshell, I just defended was what is popularly known as free market or laissez-faire economics, and only by a, a set of broad principles. We can apply those principles. 
We know investments must come from savings. We know businessmen make errors. And, but there is nothing in the economy that would cause millions of businessmen to make the same error, businessmen or businesswomen for that matter. And a society's knowledge is always growing, especially in current times. In the old times, in Alexandria, there is um, there were um, at least two fires that burned down the library of Alexandria, and a lot of knowledge was lost. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Agora. There is a poignant scene in that film where there is an attack by on the library by what are known as uh, kind of the very traditional Christians. And the polytheists in Alexandria, the first thing they do is they run into the library and save the scrolls. Because imagine if knowledge that has been stored was suddenly lost to mankind because a meteor hit the earth. The economy would go backwards by hundreds of years. But today, because of the information age, designs, algorithms, scientific discoveries, inventions, are all stored in multiple devices and in multiple libraries. So we have less to fear. And a productivity of an economy will tend to go up almost continuously if left to its own devices because its knowledge and its capacity for innovation always goes up, doesn't go backwards unless there is a major calamity, a natural calamity, or a war. Which brings me to COVID, which we were going to talk about, which is whether or not it is a natural calamity or it was um, caused by some enhancement in a lab somewhere, we don't know. Uh, and whether the calamity has been accentuated by the um, responses of a variety of governments to shut down, essentially shut down production in unrelated areas that uh, would not have otherwise automatically shut down. I mean, places like uh, cruise travel, airline travel, would have probably suffered a big blow anyway, even if left to their own devices. Nightclubs would have closed down. But the level of lockdown was in excess of, far in excess of probably what was required. Uh, there was a suppression of data available on treatments. So, what we have now is a worse situation than what would have been. But what I want to do is to take you to the situation pre-COVID in the first instance. And then we shall see why COVID has worsened it. Uh, there is an independent uh, bureau, the Bureau of the Fiscal Service, which lo looks at US, the US government as a sovereign. And one of the pet assertions of mine, if you will, has been for a long time, for many years I've said, government should be audited the same way as businesses are. In the, earlier in the talk, of, I said, if you're a housewife or a house husband, you're on an excellent foundation already. Because you would say it is not prudent to borrow behind, beyond your means. So if the family income, let us say, after taxes is $100,000 annum, per annum, and if you spend 60 every year, you save 40, you're being quite prudent. Even one of those years, if you go and take a big international cruise for the whole family, spend 20, you still save another 20. Maybe you spend all 40, where you're saving all uh, every other year. And that is a good cardinal principle that extends all the way to governments, macro economies, big corporations, as well as small corporations. The other principle, if you are a businessman, you would know that auditors look for is to is two things. One, they look at your net assets position, assets or liabilities, but they also look at your short term position so that you're not borrowing short to invest long. By that they mean if you if you take out a home loan for one year and you buy an apartment, 
even if you're on high income, you may not be in a position to retire that loan in one year, nor should the bank give you a one year loan. Typically, those loans are 20, 25 years and the calculations are done so that you can repay it comfortably with income. And if not, the bank has an asset. Um, so that's what is, those principles are reflected in an audit of a major corporations in that, what are your revenues? What are your expenses? And if the revenues are less than the expenses, what are your reserves? What are your assets? What are your long-term and short-term liabilities? And when you look at any and every government today, there are, I think, somewhere around 190 sovereigns or countries around the world. And there may be as few as one or two exceptions at the most five, which are not running very significant budget deficits year in and year out. Their revenue is taxation. Their spending to, in most cases, they are subsidizing um, certain industries, certain people, but they are also sometimes spending arguably to invest, but and borrowing to invest is okay, provided the investment is going to deliver profits. If the investment is going to deliver value greater than uh, the amount of borrowing or can be repaid through other income, then that borrowing is okay. Now you will find those principles, cardinal easy principles to understand for anyone who manages a household budget or a small business are being violated by virtually all major governments, including China. The United States is a huge and major culprit. India, Australia, the UK, Europe, even Germany, France. And Germany should know better uh, because it was one of the developed nations which less than 100 years ago suffered hyperinflation in uh, 1929. Um, the worst case of hyperinflation ever recorded, I believe, is Zimbabwe, where um, prices went up 98% every day. But even in Germany, um, workers in 1929 were being paid twice a day um, because by the time they spent the morning pay on their lunch, prices would rise again. If you went into a restaurant and ordered a cup of coffee, you would pay for it in cash. And and then if you got another cup of coffee, the prices would have gone up for the second cup. People took cash around in wheelbarrows. It's an end game when governments are so reckless and so irresponsible. And in Germany that happened because of two reasons. It was not entirely Germany which did it. Uh, there was the Marshall Plan and the First World War outcomes which were forced upon Germany by other nations. But the nation itself, the sovereign itself, was also reckless and irresponsible. They literally printed money to repay the debt. It's not what is happening today in the EU, in the UK, in the United States. There is an endless level of borrowing. But the borrowing post-COVID uh, is going to reach 30 trillion. It's going to exceed um, by large amount the US GDP. But worse than that, last year's budget deficit, I think, was close to a trillion, 984 billion. This year, the IMF is forecasting a budget deficit for the United States it's to be 3 trillion, 3.1 or trillion. In addition to that, there is a stimulus package of 2.1 trillion, uh, which has already been signed. None of this money exists in the form of saving. And the, the reason this is happening is we are in an environment which we call in economics a fiat money environment, where the central bank is a unique kind of a borrower. It's a completely different kind of a borrower than you or me. If we want to borrow some money, we have to go to the lenders, to bank or someone who lends us we can't just borrow without their permission. Unless there was a pre-authorized line that we drew on, we have to first establish a line of credit and then borrow. 
virtually everyone has to do that except the central bank. The central bank borrows money from future generations effectively without needing or asking anyone's permission. What that does, it allows the government to continually kick the can down the road, to continually be responsible because their, um, their perspective is typically short term, three, five, ten years even, is very short term when it comes to the economy. Um, some of them are actually ignorant. Many of them are actually ignorant. They do not know how much damage this sort of borrowing will do when the end game eventually comes. So now we have the BFS saying that the United States government is actually bankrupt already. The sovereign has um, liabilities in excess of assets of 2.1 trillion today. Oh, actually this is a pre-COVID number, so it'll get worse. And the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, admits that there is a very serious problem in, uh, in the U U US budget deficits. There's a professor by the name of Florence Kotlikoff, and he, said, he says, in fact, those estimates are very, very conservative. He thinks the net problem in assets in the United States had already reached 200 trillion. Um, so, uh, and that's before COVID. But he, you take the conservative numbers put forward by the CBO, they have been checked by, um, there's this one, um, there's this committee for a responsible federal budget. They're, they're an independent committee. And um, they concur with the CF, uh, CBO. Uh, last year, before COVID, the Social Security Administration predicted that in 2035, they will be effectively bankrupt from an actu actuarial point of view. And I have to qualify that statement because what they meant was not that um, Social Security will stop payments, but in the absence of any major changes, um, they will have to curtail the payments by 20%. So people will start getting 80% of what they were otherwise promised in 2035. Now the new estimate post-COVID is 2031. So it's coming dangerously close. Meanwhile, there is absolutely no way that we can see in most governments, the only thing that gets passed bilaterally and quickly is pay rises to the politicians themselves. Everything else ends up in a fight. And sorry, there are two things that get passed quickly. One, the other one is stimulus spending um, and which has done so in all the major countries today. In fact, McKinsey did a study and that study says on average, we have um, the stimulus spending due to COVID is on average 10 times the amount of stimulus spending that was done when there was a global financial crisis. Uh, it's 7.8 times in Germany uh, somewhere around six times in the United States. In Japan, it's well over 12 times. Same with uh, several European countries. Um, the UK is 10.2, the European average is 10.2. So a very, very large amount of stimula um, stimulus spending. And you have to ask, where is this money coming from? And it's coming from the central bank in a fiat money environment, even though most of them are not yet at the stage where they are printing money, they, they're borrowing. The Federal Reserve balance sheet was $4 trillion before COVID, is $7 trillion now. In the Australian Reserve Bank, of, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, which is a central bank here, their balance sheet has gone up 50%. Um, have a look at Yardeni Research, Y-A-R-D-E-N-I Research. Um, and, and they estimate that in 2020, if they aggregate three balance sheets, the Federal Reserve, which is the United States, the Bank of Japan, and um, the EU Central Bank, you end up with a number um, of increase around 49 to 50% in 2020 alone. 
surprisingly, the POBC actually comes down a little bit, uh, which is the Bank of China, People's Republic Bank of China, uh, is actually managing to lower its balance sheet. Now, the Bank of Japan was using this borrowed money to buy anything and everything, including uh, corporate bonds, even indulged in buying debt securities issued by corporations. But in fact, it doesn't matter um, which assets the central bank buys. Typically, most of it is invested in government bonds, which allows the government to keep on borrowing endlessly. But when the government is giving you between 0 to 1%, the yields on other assets, what we demand on real estate ex ante, as in before the fact, what we demand on corporate bonds, what consumers want from the stock market, all those yields automatically come down because prices always, everywhere, move in a relative fashion. It cannot be that one price is going up and the yield on that is depressed. And so let me explain that price yield relationship quickly. Suppose you hold a government bond that delivers 7% interest and it matures in one year's time and assume the interest is only delivered once a year. So yesterday was a payment date. Today, you're holding an instrument that would give you $100 plus another $7 in one year's time. But if the market is happy with 2% instead of 7, that 107 will sell in the market at something very close to 105 because people are getting 2% on that something just below 105. Um, so when going back over now to the theme of cardinal principles, when cardinal principles are violated, and this has been shown virtually in every nation throughout the history of mankind, when cardinal principles are violated, the economies do worse to the extent they are violated. When the economy works consistent with cardinal principles or as close to it as it, as it can, because there never has been a completely free economy ever, the economies do far better, even if, this is an astonishing fact, even if sometimes some political freedoms are suppressed, which I absolutely do not endorse, but that's what happens. And that is then the story of India and China, which I will um, very, very briefly cover after I finish with COVID. So where has COVID left us? COVID left us with unemployment numbers. In America, it was 3.5% in February, jumped in April to 147 is down to 7.9%. India went from 7.2% to over 23% in April. September is 6.7. Very similar pattern in Australia. Now you see a very similar pattern happened in stock markets. You look at the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, S&P 200 in Australia, the BSE, the Bombay Stock Exchange, Sensor, the NASDAQ, ASX. Uh, they all have a very similar pattern. There was a very sharp fall in March and April, particularly in April. And virtually most of the fall, in fact, in NASDAQ more than the fall, was retraced. So if you had unemployment numbers like that, we had a GDP shrinkage that the IMF is predicting for 2020 of 8% in, in the United States in most advanced economies. 10% in EU, a shrinkage. So leave aside the growth that was always forecast everywhere. 4.9, um, nearly 5% in the world, 4.5% in India. Where is this retracing in the stock market coming from? And then look at the stimulus spending and then increase, massive increases in the balance sheets of the central banks, the, the reckless borrowers, they don't have to invest in the stock market. They have to simply spend the money on 
assets they want to spend their money on, mortgage-backed securities, government bonds. And the yield flows through to all other interconnected assets in the economy when the yield falls, the price rises, like we explained in our 107 example, 107, 105. Um, price going up from 100 to 105, close to 105. So the violation of cardinal principles, a, a classic case is India of 1947 to 1991. Um, the license rise. Virtually every principle that I elucidated, I elucidated was elucidated was violated, and stubbornly so. People remember how bad housing was in cities like Mumbai and Delhi, where there was a rent control act. People remember they could not get a landline for um, up to three months. Sometimes it took years, two years. It took three years to get a computer. It was a major crisis. The economy was about to default. So there were a range of reforms in 1991 that nowhere near delivered the uh, entire package of cardinal principles, but it improved the situation significantly. So we still have a problem, um, significant levels of problems in India, which is why firms coming out of China are not going to India. Two of the chief problems are um, uncertainty of land titles, uh, which uh, one analyst, I think he's from Cato, Anirudh Berman argues there should be a land title indemnity scheme, a private land title indemnity scheme. I would argue there should be a federal land indemnity scheme to encourage um, uh, investors to come into India and start new projects. The other major uh, problem is the energy industry is still very much um, in state hands. Uh, another problem is that the US trade office had listed 11 firms, 11 countries rather, that are on their blacklist or they were on their blacklist. Uh, for violation of intellectual property. And India was in that list. China was number one in the 11, unsurprisingly. Um, so um, India must come to respect intellectual property. They have signed a new agreement in February this year with the United States in respect of intellectual property respects. I mean, to take a simple example, take two pharmaceuticals, call them F and G. F spends billions of dollars in uh, research and, and manages to, let us say, find a cure for something that wasn't there before. So G simply reverse engineers that tablet and starts distributing the same tablet at less than half the price because they don't have to recover the cost of R&D. If that happens, um, then pretty soon no one will want to be F unless they are protected. Um, and that's the nature of intellectual property violation. And with regard to China, there are sort of three explanations, two major explanations of what's going on in China and the great growth they had before COVID. One of them uh, is by professor, uh, a professor who argues that, Byland, Professor Byland, Per Byland, who argues that China's growth is a sham. It's all major projects, bridges, high-speed trains that are not necessarily economic, they're useless. And they are just, as we said before, they're just accumulating in, in the GDP statistic. The other explanation at the complete other end of the scale is a Chinese professor, Wai Lung. And he, in fact, writes for a libertarian magazine, Mises. Uh, wire. He argues that in China, there is now a lot of entrepreneurship. There are obviously the major advantages that have been recognized by several commentators, low tax regime, compliance, made easy, easy to do business, low wage rates, although not so low anymore. And because of the history of production, astonishingly good <clears throat> skills at the, at the chop floor level that have been inculcated through training for years and years, which you cannot acquire, which you cannot get elsewhere that easily. And there is a third explanation which says, both of these are true to some extent, which is that third explanation is coming from me, that there is a some, 
level of sham was going on. Uh, entrepreneurship, which uh, changed the agrarian Chinese economy where people began to leave villages to get jobs in the big industries, where some people began to leave comfortable government jobs to become entrepreneurs. So that sort of economic freedom at this small business level, small to medium business level is true. At the large business level, um, the Chinese government is very um, strict about compliance and it's very strict about an incestuous relationship, very much a crony economy. It directs, you would even have government officials sit on the board of Huawei and other major corporations. But the, there is a third element that is China has actively not just encourage their corporations to steal intellectual property, their own military and their own government is actively involved in this. And there's several accounts of that. Um, so that's the sort of balance of the Chinese magic. So what can we do is sort of my concluding point about what's coming down the pike, which is very high inflation and probable inability for the productive part of the economy to rescue major economies from the debacle that's coming down and it will hit us probably very fast if certain kinds of governments that want to ban fossil fuels come to power and it will nevertheless hit us in 10 years or so doesn't matter which government is in power because most of them are completely irresponsible. And the only benefit sometimes we can get out of a major problem happening is we see some countries like Canada in the 1990s, they managed to have very significant austerity programs slash government spending, managed to turn things around. Instead of stimulus, they began to produce budget surpluses and then that rescued the economy. So we have to hope for either an awakening due to a crisis or a pre-crisis rationality, which is very unlikely. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm open to taking more questions uh, to questions right now. Yeah, OK. Thanks, uh, Vinay. Uh, there are, <clears throat> I think, if anybody wants to post a question, one can unmute uh, himself or herself and post a question. Uh, Vinay, mm -hmm. I don't think there is any question coming. Anyway, let me see. Having said that, I have one question. Yeah, I have I a question for Vinay. Yeah, please go ahead. This is Rajesh. Yeah, Rajesh. Yeah, please go ahead, Rajesh. Yeah, Rajesh. Yeah, Rajesh. 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 Hi, Vinay. How are you? Hello. Uh, Good evening, Rajesh. Very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome, awesome discussion. You know, uh, Vinay, I, I want to hear from you some optimistic point of view as well. I mean, uh, one is the government's, uh, you know, behaving responsibly, which is, <laughs> which is anybody's guess as to, uh, to you know, when that will happen. But any other things that corporations can actually do to kind of change, change things, you know, would, would like to get your thoughts on that. Well, corporations like us should um, behave as responsibly as they can not get uh, incestuous with the government if they can if they if they can prevent it and uh, invest in innovation and R and D which they do um, but both we and as individuals and corporations are somewhat uh, helpless we are victim other than we can uh, obviously vote at the ballot box spread the knowledge of real economics um, I I would advise people to go to the Austrian site which is Mises dot org uh, book that I would recommend is capitalism a treatise on economics by Austrian George Riesman um, but outside of that it's very difficult for us to prevent because part of the problem is that politicians are human beings and if you accept the dictum that the best thing the politicians can do is to do basically nothing in terms of the economy, let it flourish, it dramatically reduces, that strategy dramatically reduces their power, their status, and which has been acquired and increased over an 
many number of years uh, and we have today a lot of politicians who are career politicians as against a 19th century politicians which really looked upon it as a public service in the truest sense of the word they left their farms or other jobs they had for a few years worked for very low wages as a public service and came back they were very serious they ought to be very serious term limits so we can't really expect politicians even if they understood the truth um to behave responsibly to the extent required what we might expect though is that some politicians will behave somewhat responsibly um before the titanic hits the iceberg and otherwise a crisis always awakens but come at the crisis come at the man the whole problem is we don't know what sort of a man or woman we get in a crisis you know when germany had hyperinflation in 1929 they had uh, they suffered like the rest of europe the great depression in 19, uh, in the 30s in 1933 a man named adolf hitler was elected to power he didn't ride on the back of a military dictatorship the nazi party actually had a very serious majority which is why hitler was um invited to become chancellor so good question rajiv but apart from spreading the knowledge of what ought to be um we pretty helpless you know, these are global forces well thank you and i uh, yeah thank you and and uh, good good i mean very enlightening thank you anand you had a question uh we have lost anand um i think anand is on mute right um he okay. he was about to ask a question when yeah, you yeah 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 sorry i was i was mute okay uh see you have sort of a drawn a very uh, pessimistic picture but um, after every wild fire there is uh, definitely a new growth so don't you see that this as an opportunity also for those who want to en- enter into new ventures or invest or for the even for the governments um there are still lots of opportunities like that. there's substantial progress as i understand it's not my field but in artificial intelligence and robotics where uh, people actually say they, they those sectors may prove to be the panacea the, the the sort of elixir that might allow governments to have to f- properly finance a ubi universal basic income for everybody yeah I I cannot speculate on whether that will happen all I would say is unlikely we shouldn't have to depend on that sort of thing um so I'm not um pessimistic about the future of human kind I'm very pessimistic about the next 10 years as you as you use the analogy after a wildfire there is new growth so if a, a wildfire obviously is a huge crisis and yes after the crisis things could actually get worse in terms of getting a, a dictatorial or authoritarian regime or there could be a discovery of what ought to be done i mean that happened in greece long time ago that happened in canada that's happened to india in 1991 although it was a partial awakening and it's happened even to china in in again it's a partial awakening to how bad chairman mao's policies were because they were all a complete violation of all cardinal principles they've gone to substantive violations so that that improvement plus the stealing of intellectual property is allowed china to go right up to number 2 in the world uh, okay last uh, srinivas has raised the hand so if he has to ask question he can unmute himself good morning srinivas I see you was I think he has put a text stop somewhere okay anyway um i don't see his text as well he has raised a hand and that's all i think maybe he's applauding your presentation okay having said that thanks a lot vinay and it was a great presentation i have the video recording which i will publish on youtube and thanks for sparing your time on behalf of board of director of garza marathi i thank you very much and we should end the meeting now
Okay, thank you for having me and thank you to all the... Thank you, Vinay.